Well, good morning, Rocky. How's everyone doing? Hope you're doing well. Go ahead and stand up if you're in the room, if you're watching online. Hey, let's, let's go. We're going to learn a brand new song today. We're looking forward to Easter. We're going to sing the song on Easter, but we want to learn it now. So let's learn it together. Do you see what I see? Sing those words again. Do you see? We sing. Do you see what I see? some exercises. Try this out. Oh, come alive. Wake up, sleeper. To see is risen. And we are risen with him. Hey. All right, here we go. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is doing and sometimes the easiest way we can do that is to look back and recognize what he has done in our lives he is faithful and we want to sing about that together let's sing this truth we've seen what you can do oh god of wonder your power has no end the things you've done before 
in greater measure you will do again cause there's no place for you can't break
God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Yeah. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. Sing in faith. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will, yes, sweet. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will. Sing it again, come on, sing it loud. I don't know how you make a way, but I know you will, yes, you will. true that we've seen in our lives over and over and over again there's just been these, these moments that we look at our circumstances and like we don't know how God's going to pull us off but he does time and time and time again and that is what fuels our faith yeah. moving forward that's where we have our confidence because we've seen God and we followed him and we've kept him at his promise and he's pulled through we don't always see it we sometimes we miss it and we chalk it up to something else but I'm telling you right now there's people in this room that can verify this, that God is faithful. And there are some of us in this room right now that are right in the middle of it. And right now you're thinking, this circumstance, I just don't know. I've messed up too much. People have hurt me too much. I don't know how we're gonna overcome this. And you need to know this. You can borrow some of our faith of those in the room who've seen God move. If you've seen God move, can you just give him praise right now? Absolutely. We can have a confidence and boldness right in the middle of the uncertainty because God is good. He promises this. He says, hey, you will have troubles in this world. But his promise continues. He said, but I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will be with you until the end. I want what's best for you. These are the promises we see from God. So right now, go ahead and take the communion. You can, you can stay uh, uh, standing. You can have a seat. We're going to sing one more song in just a minute. Whatever you want to do. Take out that communion you got when you came in the room. And if you're watching at home, wherever you are, if you have something to take, please take it with us. Otherwise, you can just sit and use this as a moment of reflection. But we recognize this. Through communion, recognizing that Jesus gave his body and his blood, we get a sneak peek into one of the most dramatic and discouraging times in church history. Jesus' best friends were sitting around taking this bread and taking this juice, not having a clue what was going on. In the next couple of days, things got even darker. But we know and they learned three days later he rose from the grave and everything made sense and they recognized this is a better way so right now we're going to take this all together you can open that bread let's take the bread right now and recognize this is Jesus' sacrifice for us let's take it now Let's take the juice, recognizing that it represents his blood. And he says this, you are worth it. His sacrifice was worth it. And he came to us and I, he identified with us, not in our victory, but he identified us with us in our suffering. And 
a failure. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us that, that Jesus, we have a savior that recognizes, recognizes everything that we've been through. So right now you might be asking yourself, does God understand how this feels right now? Let me tell you, yes, he does. But he didn't just stay there. He went to the cross, he went to the grave, and he rose again to give us victory. So even in the middle of our hardship, we can worship our God, we can praise our God. We're gonna sing one more song. Now some of you are thinking, but I'm really comfortable in my seat. That's okay. If you need to stay seated during the song, that is okay. If you need to get on your knees before God and say, God, take this from me, you can do that. But let's lean in to God right now because he is faithful and we want to give him the honor and credit that he deserves. So let's sing this song. Let's lean into it. We need to hear your voice, like I said before. It's not just us on stage. We need to hear the voices around us echoing this truth that God is faithful and he knows what living is like. He knows it. So let's sing with confidence. Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrows and some of suffering. And blood and tears. How can it be that there's a God who weeps? There's a God.
to God forever. All our voices, come on. Glory to God forever. Yeah. Again. Glory to God forever. Glory to God forever. Can we show him our praise? Let's clap our hands. Thank him. God, we praise you because you've shown up over and over and over again. And we've seen you work in the past. And God, forgive us when our perspective just wasn't right. We didn't see it and we chalked it up to something else. Maybe our own hard work. But God, we believe that you are for us. So when you have moved in the past, God, I pray that we'd see it now. And that that would give us a confidence and a boldness that no matter what we're facing right now, that we can look at it with a sense of joy and a sense of grit because we know that we can move forward, not in our own power, because of yours. That's our confidence. You are our confidence. We love you and we're grateful for it. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Hey, if you're in the room, go ahead and grab a seat. It's good to see everybody. And uh, if you don't know me, my name is Matt, one of the pastors here. And uh, if you're visiting with us, we're stoked that you have uh, chosen to spend an hour of your Sunday morning to, uh, to be with us. So thanks for being here. We're, we're starting this new series, Has Everything to Do about the invitations of Jesus. And so here's the thing, if you are new to church, or maybe this is your first time in church in a long time, uh, or, or maybe like this is your first time ever, uh, I, I wanna give you an encouragement because I think this series is gonna be so good for you because you're gonna learn so much uh, about Jesus and this whole thing has to do about Jesus. And here's the other thing, if you're in the room and you're a Christian, you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time and you've been going to church like your whole life, and, and here's the deal, I'm glad you're here as well because you need to be reminded about the invitation that you have already received and you need to be challenged about the invitation that you are supposed to be giving and how you live your life. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but have you ever been invited to something and you didn't know that you were invited to it? Uh, this happened to me uh, just this week. In fact, yesterday, last night, uh, we celebrated Dane Voorhees' birthday. Now, Dane is on our worship uh, team. He's not on the stage this morning, but he turned 30 last week. And I know what some of you are thinking, wow, I didn't realize he was that old. He, he's getting old, okay? <laughs> so he turned 30, and, um, and we did a surprise a birthday party uh, for him last night. Now, here's the thing. About a week and a half ago, I'm buzzing around the campus here at, at Frederick, and I'm checking in with some of my staff, and eventually somebody comes up to me, and they go, hey, um... Are you, are you coming to Dane's uh, birthday party? And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And, they, and I could see the fear in their eyes because right away they're thinking, oh man, um, if Matt didn't get invited to this party and then I just asked them about it, I, I, I might be in trouble. And so I said, what, what, what are you talking about? They said, oh, you know, it's just a birthday party. It's going to be on Saturday. And uh, you had to be invited. I mean, didn't you get invited? I said, I, I literally have no idea what you're talking about. And... Um, and so they're like, oh, so, you know, they kind of walked away <laughs> abruptly. And so I, then I went home, and I'm having dinner with my wife, Vanessa, and we're at the table, and we're eating dinner. And I look at her, I go, hey, did, did we get invited to uh, Dane's uh, birthday party? She goes, yeah. <laughs> I said, all right, um, when were you going to tell me? She said, it's on the calendar. I said, I don't look at the individual days like 30 days, you know, and, I, and she goes, I'm telling you right now. And I said, okay, it's great. I, it just would have been nice to know that I was invited because I didn't know I was invited. And here's the thing, again, if, if you're new to church, you got to know this, that Jesus has invited you into something that I think is pretty, pretty incredible, pretty life-changing, but you just may not know that you've, you've been given an invitation. And you might not even know, like, what, what, the, what the party will look like. And maybe you know there's an invitation, but, you, you know, you don't know who else is going to be there. You don't, you don't necessarily know all the details because you've heard from other people or you've been to other churches before or you've bumped into other Christians. You're just not quite sure what's on the other side of the invitation if you actually show up. And so these are the questions that we want to be answering in this series. And here's what I want to do today. I want to go to maybe... One of the most well-known invitations that Jesus ever gave. In fact, it's, he, he's going to be starting his ministry. I mean, he's, he's been on the earth for, you know, 30 plus years. And, and here, here he's about to start his, his ministry. He starts to kind of recruiting his team. He starts recruiting his, his guys and his girls. And he starts offering this invitation. 
And, and if you've grown up in the church, you've read some of these stories uh, before, but uh, this might be his most famous invitation, all right? And so if you have your Bibles, this is Matthew chapter 4, and um, this is what Matthew tells us about as Jesus begins recruiting his, his crew. Verse 18, here's what it says. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake because they were fishermen. Now here's the invitation, verse 19. He looks at him and just says, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. Now look at this. This is crazy. Verse 20, at once they left their nets and followed him. It's very interesting. I mean, I've seen preachers, you know, get up there and they get into this verse and like, hey, following Jesus is easy. You just do it, okay? You just, you hear the call and you just start following him. Everything works out and they just preach, you know, faith, faith, faith. You just got to trust God. This is what you do. And it keeps going with this, verse 21. And then, you know, going out from there, Jesus keeps walking along the beach here. He saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in the boat with their dad. They're also preparing their nets. And Jesus called them, saying, you know, come follow me. Verse 22, look at this, craziness. And immediately they left their boat and their dad. I love that, that, they, that Matthew put that in there. They left their boat and their father and followed him. So, again, you just... Like reading this story, and some random guy like is walking on the beach, looks out to these fishermen. He's like, "Hey guys, you you should come follow me." And they they can't help themselves but jump out of the boat and and leave their their family heritage of fishing. They left their dad right, and they just start following a guy. At least this is how it reads in Matthew. They just start following a guy. They don't even know. And you might go when you hear that story. Well, that doesn't seem very realistic. That's not the world I live in. I mean, that even seems a bit irresponsible. And if you feel like that a little bit, I I agree with you. I agree with you. I hear that story and I go, man, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. Because as a parent, I teach my kids to do the opposite. When random strangers walk up to them, they're like, hey, you should come with me. And I, I got candy, right? What do we teach our kids? You don't follow them. What are you doing? They're strangers, all right? And so you go the opposite direction. But here's what you need to know about this invitation. There is a backstory. There's a backstory that Matthew, uh, he doesn't really give us the whole backstory in in his writing. There's a whole other story that's happening here. And even in this story, there's some more details that kind of make the story make a little bit more sense. And so we've got four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is Matthew. But Luke, he also tells us the story. And he also gives us the backstory to the invitation. So here's what Luke says. Before this story even happens, this guy Peter, who was just in one of these boats, uh, Peter is starting to hear some things about this guy named Jesus. There's a buzz around town about what this guy is up to. And so one day, uh, Peter is hanging out in the synagogue or, or like a church service like we're doing this morning. And after church, he goes up to Jesus and he says, hey, um, you want to come to my house for lunch? We, my wife and I, we would love to have you over for lunch. You know, we're hearing all these good things about you. You know, just come over. And so Jesus says, yeah, I'll come over to your house for lunch. And so they're walking to Peter's house. And Peter kind of nudges Jesus and is like, hey, hey, bro, uh, we're excited to feed you. But really, the reason why we asked you to come over to the house, because we heard some stories about how you might be the son of God or something. I don't quite know all that kind of stuff. But we heard stories that you could heal people. And, our, you know, my mother-in-law lives with me. That's one thing already. The second thing is she lives with me because she's sick. So I'm wondering if you could might heal her, you know. Jesus is like, I, okay. So they go to his house. They have lunch together, and Jesus does. Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. And it, it's a great story. It's an incredible story. But the, the bigger part of that narrative is, is that Jesus actually heals Peter's mother-in-law on the Sabbath which under Jewish law at that time was a no-no. You could not do miracles on the Sabbath. But Jesus is, you know, he's breaking all kinds of rules. So he heals it and he kind of says, hey, we got to kind of keep this hush-hush. We don't want this getting out because, you know, technically I'm not really supposed to be doing this and not trying to cause a stir. It doesn't work because Luke tells us in chapter 4, verse 40, look at this. And at sunset, this is right after Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. At sunset, word already gets out and the people brought to Jesus uh, all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Now, 
I'm telling you all this so that you would know, don't forget this, Peter is watching all of this. This is all happening before the, you know, come follow me deal on the boat. I mean, this is, he's kind of watching all of this. His mother-in-law is healed, and, and because of that, word gets out, and now his house has become like this hospital. And people are just rolling in, and then Jesus is healing them, one after the other after the other. Verse 42, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place, and the people were looking for him. And when they came to, to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. Look at this, verse 43. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to, you know, the other people that are around. So because that is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now, that is all a little bit of the backstory. So then you get to the story that we just read in Matthew. But Luke also tells us the story. Same story. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1, but he also gives us a little bit more details. It's as if Luke knows somewhere along the way people are going to have a little bit more questions to ask. He knows it, and so he gives us a little bit more. So here's a little bit more of the story, okay? Chapter 5, verse 1 says this. One day, one day as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him. So before even this whole boat incident, Jesus teaching, there's a crowd. and, And Luke says they're listening to the word of God. So this is interesting. Jesus is teaching and people have come to hear, to learn. And here's why. Because they have heard, just like Peter somewhere along the way, they saw something, they heard something, or they know somebody who saw something or heard something and word got out that there's this guy who's saying things that nobody else is saying. And I think one of the reasons too, Luke kind of gives us a little bit more of this information is so that we might even begin to understand that following Jesus, now you just got to hear me out on this, following Jesus does not begin with faith. It does not. In fact, all the stories that we have of of people of faith in the New Testament, they begin following Jesus and they don't even fully know who this guy is. They just start following him around because of what he's saying and what he's doing. Following Jesus does not begin with faith. It doesn't even really begin with belief. I mean, you can follow, not even believe him. It begins with, and here's what I find to be true, following Jesus begins with questions. It begins with curiosity. It begins with trying to understand a little bit more about who Jesus is, and if you're here this morning, maybe what this whole church thing is about. Jesus knows that if you begin following, then just maybe one day you might come to a conclusion about who he is, but very rarely do you come to that conclusion immediately. It takes some time (laughs) to wrestle with the things that Jesus is is saying. So it keeps going, verse 2. And Jesus saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. And the reason why they're washing their nets, because they've been fishing all night. They would fish at night, and so they have come in in the morning, and and they're cleaning their nets. They're getting ready to go home. So you have this moment, Jesus teaching on the shore. There's a large crowd of people. And there's these fishermen with their boats on the shore that are packing it up for the day. And uh, look at this, verse 3. So he, Jesus, got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's Peter, the, the, the guy whose mother-in-law was healed by Jesus, and asked him to put out a little bit from shore. And then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. So there's so many people, they're crowding around. You know how it is. Like They're trying to get as close to Jesus as possible. Jesus sees the boat. The boat kind of becomes his stage. Verse 4, and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, Jesus gets done teaching, and then he gives Peter an invitation, and it's not a typical invitation that you might have experienced in a church before. It wasn't come down front to the altar, Peter, get saved, repent all of your sins. It wasn't that. His invitation was, Peter, let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. Not, you should give it all up. Not, I want you to leave your dad in the boat. Not, you know, leave everything you have and and come follow me. We're not there yet. That's not what he says. He just says to Peter, Peter, I want you to take a small step right now. You're a fisherman, right? Peter, yeah, he goes, yeah, I'm a fisherman. All right, let's go fishing. But Peter, here's the thing. Let's go out into deep water. Let's maybe go out a little further than what you were fishing last night. Now look at this, verse 5. So Simon answered, Peter answered, Master, which is a sign of respect. Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. 
Jesus, we clean the, we're cleaning the nets right now. Listen, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught anything. I mean, if we haven't caught anything when you're supposed to catch fish, we're probably not going to catch any fish when you're not supposed to catch fish. Also, Jesus, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a fisherman. This is what I do. Bro, you're a carpenter. All right? You make the boats I fish off of, okay? You don't know anything about fishing. And listen, we're tired. We're packing it up for the night. This is not really, you know, what we're interested in doing. Good message and everything. In fact, bro, really great preaching. But I was ready to go 20 minutes ago, okay? I wasn't even ready for you to get in my boat. You didn't ask me whatever. You just got in. It's cool. We had lunch together. But listen, I'm clocking out. Like my day is done. I work the night shift. I'm, I'm ready to go, to go home. And here's the thing. In this moment, this is such a pivotal moment for Peter and, and all the other guys there. I mean, this is a huge moment. And they have no idea what hangs in the balance. No idea. See, for them, it's just another day. This is what they do. They're fishermen. They went fishing. The only thing that's different is there's this guy on the shore who's teaching, who just happened to get in one of their boats. Now he's, he's asking them, hey, can we go fishing? Can we go fishing? These guys have no idea. They're ready to clock out. They're ready to go home. They're tired. This moment, I mean, at best, is just a huge inconvenience for them. Peter would rather be home. But, see, here's what I think. But, because of what we know with the backstory about what happened with Peter and his mother-in-law, Peter's thinking, bro, you did me a solid. You helped me out. You healed my mother-in-law. So, and so then look what he says at the end of it. You know, listen, we haven't caught anything. And then look, look what he says, verse 5. But, but because you say so, like, listen, I know I owe you because you did something for me that nobody else could do. So, listen, I owe you. So, I man, I will let down the nets. It's an amazing moment, and we kind of go right past it. But this is the moment. This is part of the invitation. And these guys have no idea what hangs in the balance. In fact, if these guys tell Jesus right now, no, listen, dude, we're not interested in fishing. We've been fishing all night. We'll go another day, another time. And they pack it up and go home. We wouldn't be talking about this story. And nobody in here would be named Peter. These would just be some guys who lived in the first century who were fishermen, and they were okay, but they're not going to stand out. Nobody's going to be writing stories about them. They have no idea. Peter didn't know this, that 2,000 years after this, there'd be a team in March Madness that just wrecked all of your tournament, you know, brackets. That St. Peter's University, which I'm rooting for them now, you know what I'm saying, I'm in. You didn't, he didn't know that? You think that he knew 2,000 years ago in that boat going, if I say yes right now, there will be this basketball tournament and there will be a team that, that is going to ruin people's lives. I'm in, Jesus. Let's go fishing. <laughs> he has no idea. He, there's going to be hospitals named after this guy, churches named after He has no idea. He has no idea what hangs in the balance. But look, look, look. The reason why he says yes, because there's a backstory. He still doesn't even believe in who Jesus is. Jesus has just done some things for him. Well, Jesus, because you say so. If there's somebody else, I'd probably say no, but because you said so and you served me and you had lunch with you know, me and my family, and so I'll, I'll go. We have no idea what hangs in the balance when we say yes to the requests of God. You have no idea. We have no idea. We, we go right through them. We blow right by them. Peter has no idea what's about to happen or the invitation that Jesus is giving him. But because it's Jesus, Peter goes, all right, I'm, I guess I'm in. I guess I'm in. Look, look what it says, verse 6. And when they had done, notice they it wasn't about believing in this moment. They're not even really thinking about it too much. They didn't have a... You know, a little, little prayer session on the boat. There was no votes. This Jesus made a request, and they kind of know who he is a little bit, which I would remind all of us that in the context, you know, of being obedient, what God calls us to, it's not just about listening. At some part, it's about the doing, because the doing makes all the difference. And some of us have been Christians for so long, we forgot that. We stopped doing, and we just wanted to be listening 
And Jesus begins to lean in. I mean, he's setting really the invitation and he's using like, like, the, like the props of fishing. But he's looking at Peter and he's going, hey, you don't know what we're about to do here in just a second. But I want to teach you a lesson about the calling that you're about to receive from me, the invitation. And listen, this is about fishing, not in the shallow waters, but in the deep waters. We're going to the deep waters, Peter. Peter goes, well, I, I, listen, I'm not really in the mood, but because it's you, Jesus, I'll go do it. So, so when they had done so, what Jesus asked them to do, they caught, look at this, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets begin to break. I wish I was there. Now they're experiencing something they've never had happen to them before. Verse 7, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full they began to sink. You wish you had that fishing story. You know what I'm saying? It is chaos. There are people, you know, screaming. There's commotion. Don't forget, you know, there's a huge crowd on the beach that's watching all of this happen. The greatest fishing story in the history of the world. Notice Peter's response, verse 8. And when Simon Peter saw this, what did he do? He fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Now, why would that be his response? Here's why. Because right up to that point, the idea of the righteousness of God was that God created distance with people who were sinners. And in this moment, here's what Peter realizes. I'm a sinner. This guy's not. He, he's healing mother-in-law's. He's healing sick people in the community, and apparently he's a really good fisherman. He's better than me. Everything this guy touched is made right. It's renewed. It's restored. It's redeemed. And Peter, in his thinking about who he is and who Jesus is, he goes, we might be inches apart, but we should be miles apart. I have no business being this close to you. I'm some rando dude who's a fisherman who just wanted you to heal my mother-in-law. That's it. But I realize you are, you are somebody. You just might be who you say you are. And here's the thing that Jesus is doing this moment. Jesus is saying, listen, I get it why, why you're feeling this, but I'm changing things. See, being a sinner, listen, Peter, I get it. We live in this culture, in this system. Like, if you are not righteous or you don't look clean or, or you're not, you know, the goody two-shoe Christian or whatever, I know they push you out, you know, out of the city. You're an outcast. But listen, I'm changing things. See, being a sinner doesn't disqualify you from following Jesus. Peter, listen, it's a prerequisite. See, you can only follow me if you are a sinner. Perfect people are allowed. See, Peter, look, being an unbeliever doesn't disqualify you from following me because, look, all of Jesus' followers, including Peter, at some point will believe and then unbelieve and then believe and unbelieve again. Jesus says, listen, th this isn't how we talk about following or not following. There's going to be moments you believe and unbelieve. There's going to be moments that, listen, you're not getting it all right. Jesus is saying to him, I still want to be close. Verse 9 keeps going, for, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, Simon's partners. Then Jesus, then, look, then Jesus said to Peter, don't be afraid. Just one of many times he's going to tell Peter that on a boat in the water. Don't be afraid. Here's the invitation. From now on, Peter, you will fish for people. Boys, I've got plans. And I want you to come with me because we're about to go change the world. Verse 11. So, now it makes sense. So what they do? They pulled up their boats up on the shore and they left everything. And they followed him. And all four of these guys would die with nothing, including regret. Jesus tells Peter, you're going to be a fisher of men. But if you're going to do that, Peter, you got to go out into the deep water. you got to go where the fish are, Peter, the big fish. And to use the fishing analogy, and I can say this because I've been in church my whole life. We just have to own this, especially for those of us who are Christians, that we often choose to spend too much time in the safe, shallow waters. 
staying within the comfort and the confines of church buildings and church groups, rather than going out into the deep waters. Now, hold on to that story because we're going to leverage that in just a second. Let me just leverage that story a little bit with who we are as a church and why we do what we do and why we say what we say. So if you didn't know this, that this would be brand new. This is good information for you. If you've known this, this is just a refresher. But here's the mission of our church. If you don't know this, let me just remind you. Here's the mission of our church. When people, you know, when I bump into people in the community, they go, what's Rocky all about? What, what are you guys doing? Here's what I say, all right? Here's the mission of our church. Know Jesus and love like him. That's the mission of our church. Hey, wh- what are you guys trying to do? We're trying to know Jesus. We're trying to love like him. And the love like him, that's the deep waters part, all right? But we're trying to know Jesus. We're trying to love like him. It's very simple, yet it's very powerful. It's very portable. And as a church, here's what we believe. As a church, we just believe that when somebody who dies, talking about Jesus, when somebody who dies, who claims to be the son of God, who calls his own death, burial, and resurrection and pulls it off, we just go with what that guy says. We just go, well, we just, we're just going to go with that guy. We have seen enough. This is where Peter is and, and on the boat. He goes, listen, I've seen enough. This guy's telling me to follow him, so I'm going to do it. When we see a guy pull off his own death, burial, and resurrection, we just go, we just go with what he says. And I know you're thinking, what's he say? Glad you asked. Look at this. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. That guy says this to the church, to you, if you're a Christian. If, he's, if you just want to know what this whole thing is all about, here's what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. Say witnesses. witnesses. Not bad. Witnesses. witnesses. There you go. I didn't have to ask you. It's when you're, you're, you're witnesses. Where? Where are you witnesses? Look what he says in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. So Jesus looks at the church and he tells them, here's the deal, guys. If you believe in who I, you know, who, who you, who I say I am, I want you to go out into the whole world. I want you to expand this kingdom. How are we going to do that? Jesus, when we get out to deep waters, what lures are we supposed to use? What time should we go fishing? I mean, how is this going to work? And Jesus goes, here's how you're going to do it. You're going to be witnesses. You're going to tell people what you have seen. You're going to tell people there is a guy who claimed to be the son of God who died and he came back from the dead. And you saw it. You saw it. Then Jesus will go a little bit further. Even tells us the attitude in which we should do that. What's the attitude in our witnessing? What should it look like? Well, John 13, he has this big discussion with his disciples before he's crucified. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another by this. Everyone will know that you are my disciples by what? By how you love. Okay. And here's what we have to own as a church and the culture and the context in which we live. If we even get out to some deep fishing, usually how we talk to people and what we have witnessed is not really filled with love. We tend to jump in those conversations thinking this is an argument and a fight that we need to win. And if we're not fighting, usually we're being offended. I can't believe. That's how some of you witness and it doesn't work. You know, I can't believe you're, you know, you would do that. And I go, I can believe it. They don't know who God is. I can't believe that there's people who say they know who God is, who act like they don't know who God is. But we got to stop looking at the world going, I can't believe this person would do this. And you're just offended or you're, you're trying to win a fight. All the wrong lures. You don't catch fish like that. Jesus goes, no, 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 that's not what you're going to do. You're going to tell stories about what you have seen, what you have experienced. You're not out there to win a fight. You're out there to love people. I think if Jesus was here, if Peter was here, we're like, dude, tell us about the fishing, about the call in your life to be fishers of men. I think he would say something like this. Hey, guys, if you want to be a great fisherman, then you got to stop being offended by people who don't know Jesus because Jesus wasn't. If there was anyone who should have been offended, it should have been him. I mean, there was moments we treated that guy like he wasn't the son of God. And he still invited us. You should stop doing that and then start, start telling people about, you know, the Jesus that we have experienced in our lives. You should start investing in people and inviting people in a loving way. Because that's what Jesus did for us. And so that's what we should do for others. I mean, Peter go, listen, this isn't about winning an argument. I wasn't trying to win an argument. We, were, we weren't here to win arguments. We were here to love people. 
I mean, that's why Jesus got crucified. You guys know that, right? I mean, Jesus got crucified because the religious people were so concerned that Jesus was spending a lot of time with sinners. And it made them very uncomfortable in their kind of religious tradition in their setting. I mean, you guys know that, right? I mean, that's why Jesus got crucified. We all knew that. I mean, Peter would look at us and he'd say, guys, I was a fisherman. I had, I had no right to be following a rabbi. I mean, that's I mean, that's one of the reasons why when he called me and I saw who he was, I mean, I wasn't like follower of rabbi material. But for some reason, he wanted to be close to me, and so I, I, I did that. And so you take all of that story, you take the mission of the church and the invitation that God has given to us, and here's what I just want to leave you with. I want to encourage you and challenge you to do one thing that could change, you know, something for one person. And this is, the, I'm just telling you, this house, it's all set up. Jesus set it up like this. Because when you read the New Testament, this guy is just going from one place to one place, and he seems to be doing the same thing over and over and over again. And here it is. He's inviting people. It starts with an invitation. It starts with an invitation. He gets to know people. He's meeting needs. He's healing mother-in-laws. Praise God. He's doing all kinds of stuff. And then he says, you know what? If you want to, you should come follow me. And he gives the invitation to people that in that culture shouldn't get an invitation. I mean, Matthew, who's a tax collector, that's why my name is Matthew. Even Peter, this is why we just got to own this. Peter, who got called before Matthew, who got the invitation before Matthew. Peter, the fisherman, who needed a, you know, a healed mother-in-law and the, and the best fishing story ever. He needed all of that before he would receive the invitation to follow Jesus. That guy had a big problem with the invitation to Matthew. You want to know why? Because Matthew was also a Jew, but he was robbing his people. And Peter will look at Jesus and go, listen, I get it. I'm a fisherman, but I'm not as bad as that guy. And Jesus will look at Matthew and he will say to Matthew, Matthew, you should come follow me. And he did. Here's what you should do. You should invite others. Who? Everybody. Everybody. You should invite others. You want to talk about discipleship? Let's talk about it. Jesus' discipleship pathway always ends with invitations for people to come and meet Jesus. Meaning that if you're a follower of Jesus, but because of how you're living, and if you're giving invites or not, if people aren't receiving your invitation and coming to meet with Jesus, then, I'm just telling you, in the discipleship pathway that Jesus puts out for his guys, if there's no invitation then I'm not quite sure you're as good of a follower of Jesus as you think. I'm all about Bible studies. I hope you have the whole thing memorized. I hope you worship and lose your mind and you get your hands up. I hope you gather with groups and you encourage one another and you're there when you're in, you know, someone in your group's going through tough times. But friends, let me just remind you, the callings of the first disciples was this, come follow me. And I'll make you a fisher of men. See, these guys will have to learn over and over again, oh, yeah, this isn't about me. Oh, yeah, this isn't about me. Oh, yeah, this isn't about me. The invitation was something bigger than me. Jesus, what about me? Hey, listen, this whole thing is about a broken world. It's about people who are far from God, and I've chosen to use you. I asked you to come with me. God's going to use you to reach one more person. Listen, we, we should be the greatest inviters in the history of the world, inviting others to come and see what Jesus has done and what Jesus has said. We invest and invite, invest and invite, invest and invite. We're not weird or creepy. We invest and invite. We invest and invite. Invest and invite. I've said this before, the easiest invitation. You invest in people. You have lunch with people, you have coffee with people. You bring your neighbor cookies, because cookies change everything. You know what I mean? You just, just be normal. You just live, encourage people. And you invest and you invest and invest, and one day you can invite. You invest, and then you invite. You invest and you invite. You invest and you invite. And you invite, and you say something like this, hey, you should come. You should come sit with me at my church. You should come sit with me at my church. Not, hey, you should come to church. You should come. No, you should come sit with me at my church. 
you should just come sit with me at my church. You invest, you invest, you invest, and eventually if you invest long enough, they're going to come up to you and, be, and they're going to say something like this. Man, life is hard, isn't it? Woo! I'm married, and let me tell you this story, and I'm trying to raise these kids, I'm trying to pay these bills. Yeah. This is how you, this is how you invite. Yeah, that is tough. Woo. And this is not what we do. This is what we did 40 years ago, all right? Yeah, that is tough. My life's perfect. And if you want to be perfect, you should follow Jesus like me. That's not, that's not what we do. Man, marriage is so hard. You're right, it is hard. Man, I, I have, have seasons of my life where I've been right where you are. You know what helps? I, no, what helps? You should come sit with me at my church. I, I, listen, they, they, they just, it just helps. I know, you know, I know church and this, and it's weird. You got a church story, and you know a Christian, and our boss is a Christian. He doesn't act like a Christian. I get it. But listen, I've, I've been where you are, and you, you should just come sit with me at my church. It just seems to help. It just seems to help. You just come sit with me at my church. Listen, Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven down to earth, and here's how he did it. He invited everyone to participate in it. Everyone. It's what got him killed. Because he was inviting people that other people didn't think he should be inviting. And here's what I know. There are more adults, there are more kids, there are more middle school and high school student, students in our area than ever before. We have been given an incredible opportunity as a church to be a part of the mission that God has called us to. And there are some people who hear that and they go, oh, he's just saying that because he wants Rocky to be a big church. Here's my sound bite. You're darn right. Yes, I want Rocky to be the biggest church it can be. Not for the sake of numbers, not so I can get up here and go, look at me, I'm so good. No, because there are people who are far from God and I have a story that's changed my life and I believe it can change their life. You're darn right. I want us to be the biggest church we can be. You want to know why? Because that's discipleship. Reaching more people with the story that has changed our life to be witnesses to people who have never had that kind of fishing story before. So if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, let me just ask you. All right, here's a question. I'm just asking you. Do you have somebody? Like, who is your one? Who is your one? That you're thinking about right now, they don't know Jesus, they've never been part of a, this, you know, a boat story like that before. They haven't experienced the, some of the things that you've experienced in your journey with Jesus, but you know what? You're going to pray for them. You're going to pray for the one. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, you haven't been praying for somebody to bump into Jesus. I'm just telling you, you're not as close to Jesus as you think. If you've just been praying for your circumstances and you want your stuff and your life to get better, but we're not thinking about the people around us, then we've got to recenter our hearts with God's. Because the call was to go fishing for people. So who are you praying for? I mean, I hope you're praying for one. I hope you're investing in one. And if you're praying and investing in one, I'm telling you it's going to lead to a day where you can invite one again without being weird or creepy. And I bumped into so many stories over the last couple of months who people will come up to me and they'll say, this is my one. Do a good job. <laughs> Don't screw this up. Thanks for the encouragement. <laughs> we should be consumed with this because it consumed Jesus and it consumed his first guys that he invited to be part of this movement that we eventually call the church. We're praying for one more. We're investing in one more. We're inviting one more. Both campuses you saw in the lobby, the, the, you know, for the one wall. Listen, we just want to be a church that's going to be unapologetic, saying we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to get it all right. And you want to know why? Because we're filled with people and we're all messy. But here's one thing we want to keep in the forefront, that this church exists. Because 2,000 years ago, there was a guy on the earth who claimed to be the son of God who invited one. And then one more. And then one more. And one more. And one more. You're here because somebody somewhere along the way invited you either because of what they said or how they lived in such a way you had to go see. And you don't even know why. But somewhere along the way, 
all of a sudden, this story about who Jesus is, it just made sense. You know what? One of our values here at our church is this. We're going to be for the one. You know what would be cool? <laughs> and I'll end with this in prayer. You know what would be cool? If we would be a church that would be unapologetic, that we would even be a church that would be willing to set aside our preferences for the sake of reaching one more person in our community with the gospel. This, would, this is what would be awesome. I'm telling you, this would change this town. This would change, you know, this would change our country, change the world. If we could be a church, all right, filled with church people, because we predominantly are filled with church people, that are consumed with reaching one more person with the gospel, who would be willing to set our preferences aside so that we might accomplish that goal and that mission, that our default would be that when we see a change in church, that something would fire in our brains and you go, I don't even like that. I don't know why we changed that. Why is Matt wearing ties all of a sudden? I don't get it. I like when he was wearing flannel. I don't know why, you know, if you could just walk out of here and go, dude, they made some changes here. I don't even like them. But oh, I bet I know why they did it. I, it wasn't my first thought, but after we were thinking about it, and I, I bet you they did it because they think they can reach more people. Oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. This whole thing is not all about me. I bet you they're looking at the community in which they live, and they just thought, you know what? We could use our resources better. And I get it. The way that I bumped into Jesus may not be the way that everybody else in the future is going to bump into Jesus. I don't even care. I'm just glad we're bumping into people with Jesus. You know what would be refreshing? This would change the world. If church people would walk in the church, and instead of getting upset about what it looks like and what it sounds like, if we had Christians walking around going, dang it, we should be reaching more people. How come we're not reaching more people? What do we need to be doing to be reaching more people? I'm going to go meet with Matt because I want to talk about how can we reach more people? How can we be filled with so much grace that church people begin wigging out? I mean, I just want to sacrifice. What do we need to do to reach one more with the gospel? And I'm telling you, that the reason why the church exists 2,000 years ago is because that's what that church 2,000 years ago led with. Whew. What do we got to do to reach one more? You got to be witnesses. You got to be great storytellers. And you got to be filled with love. If you don't know Jesus, here's what you got to know. You've been invited. And as somebody who works at a church and leads in a church, if that invitation wasn't delivered to you in love, I'm sorry. But you just got to know, on the other side of that invitation is something amazing. It's a life filled with grace and mercy and love and joy. And it's not perfect. And us Christians don't always get it right. But it's changed my life. And many of the people here, it's changed theirs. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you got to hear this today. That the greatest mission God has called you to is in return, be the greatest inviter. Because you were invited. We invite everybody and anybody to come in here and to come and see. And what you'll find is their life, somewhere along the way, will get be changed with the same story that changed your life. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you this morning for the reminder and the encouragement of who you are. And I pray that you would empower your church to be encouraged and equipped this morning to be the greatest witnesses and storytellers that the world has ever seen. That we might even set aside our preferences for the sake of one more person to bump into you. I'm thankful for those guys 2,000 years ago on that boat that would receive your invitation to follow. And I pray for those this morning who wrestle with the same invitation that they just might see who you are in all your fullness. Father, we love you, and we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. One quick reminder on the way out, both campuses, we've got some invitation cards for Easter. One of the easiest invites in the history of the church. Grab one, invite one. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.